This is Flip Mini Lecture number 29, and I'm going to cover a lot of night section 11.1 and 11.2, but not all of it. And in 11.1, Knight defines momentum. And uh, by the end of 11.2, he's proven that systems with many particles in them have uh, conservation of total momentum. So I'm going to do both those things. The thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to define this thing called impulse yet. Okay? So let's define momentum. If you have a particle, it has some position, R. It has some velocity, V, which we can write as dr dt. We're going to define a new thing about that particle. We're going to define its momentum. And it's this combination. It's just its mass times its velocity. Okay, so velocity is a vector. Position is a vector. This is a vector. Of course, it's got three components, just to make it obvious. The first component is m times the x component of the velocity. The second component is m times the y component of the velocity. And the third component is m times the z component of the velocity. And if you're in fewer than three dimensions, then it's just mvx, or mvx and mvy. Okay. We've got to give this thing a name. It's called the momentum, and the letter M has already been used, so we give it the name P. P is equal to MV. Now, if you have a whole bunch of different particles in a system, then and they were labeled by some index, maybe you have capital N particles in your system, and you label them by some index, I, and... Maybe you uh, let i run from 0 to n minus 1 if you're a programmer, or if you count like normal people do, maybe you let i run from 1 to n. Anyway, however you index your particles, you can define for each particle in the system, you can define a momentum. And of course, p sub i, the momentum of the ith particle, is the mass of the ith particle, times the velocity of the ith particle. Now, if you have a system that has n particles in it, we can define the total momentum of the system, P, this is a capital P now, capital P, maybe just to emphasize that, I'll put a little serif down there. Capital P is equal to the sum over I of little p sub i. Or if you want to write that out, it's the sum over i of m i v i. Where this i, again, is not a component or anything like that, or the i step in a path, this i here is running over all the particles in the system. Okay. Now, if you have a whole pile of particles in a system, they each might be pushing on each other. So uh, particle two might be pushing on particle five. And the way, we write, the way we write that is we write the force of two on five. Of course, we know from Newton's third law that partic if particle two is pushing on particle five, then particle five is pushing back on particle two. And we know those two are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And of course, this is true for any pair of particles, that Fij is equal to minus Fji. Okay, so there's Newton's third law uh, written in terms of these indices, i and j, force of, on, of the i particle on the jth particle is opposite, but otherwise equal to, it's exactly opposite the force of the jth particle on the ith particle. Now watch this. Watch this. 
let's take the derivative with respect to time of capital P. Okay, this is some vector. Now I'm gonna take the time derivative of this vector. The derivative with respect to time of capital P, well, you can write it all out. The masses are, obvi are obviously not changing. So this becomes the sum over I of M sub I times the derivative with respect to time of V sub I. Okay, but that MI dVI dt, that's equal to the sum over I, that's M I and the acceleration of the ith particle. Sum over I of M I A I because dV dt is the acceleration. But this is the combination that appears on the right hand side of Newton's law. This, the right here, is what appears for the ith particle on the right hand side of Newton's law. So we know, let's go look at, let's go kind of explode this part of the, of the, of the problem a little bit. This is equal to the sum over all the forces on uh, particle I, okay? So we have a sum over all the forces on particle I inside this sum over I. So this is the same as that. So we got sum over all the particles I, and now we have the sum over all the forces on I. Now the forces on I are caused by all the other particles in the system. I mean, if we've got everything in our system, we've accounted for it all, whatever's pushing on any of the particles in our system must be one of the other particles in our system. Otherwise the system isn't complete. And we will talk about incomplete systems soon, systems which have outside forces acting on them. But if this is the complete system, then this sum of, of all the forces on I must be caused by all the other particles in the system. So this must be the sum over I, I haven't messed with that at all. This must be the sum over J, where J runs over all the other particles in the system, sum over J where J is not equal to I, of the force of particle uh, J on particle I. Okay, so maybe at this point it might be right good if I wrote this out for the case that say N is equal to cap capital N is equal to three. Okay, so I'm going to write out what this mess is right here in the case that capital N is equal to three. So there, all I've done is put capital N equal to three in the formula. And now I'm gonna write out uh, the first term with I equals one. Then I'm gonna write out the second term with I equals two and the third term with I equals three. But for the term with I equals one, I've got a term with J equals two or J equals three. Okay, 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 okay. So I'm doing the I equals one case right now. If I equals one, J goes from one to three, but not equal to I, so that means I've got F 
uh, 2 on 1 plus f of 3 on 1. Now let's do the i equals 2 terms. That's plus, I'm setting i equals 2 here, set i equals 2 here, so 2, 2. Now I'm supposed to sum over j not equal to 2. That means I get the first one and the third one. Okay, and then I'm going to do the i equals 3 term in this stinking sum. It's getting kind of messy. Plus f something 3, f plus f something 3. The j terms that contribute to this are j equals 1 to 3, but, but with j not equal to i, which is currently 3, so that means j equals 1 or 2. So this one gives me j equals 1 and j equals 2. Okay. So there's the sum written all out for you for the case that n equals capital 3. But now look at this. F3, 1, thanks to Newton's third law, is minus F1, 3. F3, 1 is minus F1, 3. And both of those appear here. So they exactly cancel each other out. Sorry, this was supposed to be dpdt on the left, by the way. I would written p as all that. dpdt is on the left. Now, let's look a little more closely. Here we have f21, but here we have f12. So since f21 and f12 appear in this sum, but f21, thanks to Newton's third law, is the opposite of f12, those two cancel each other out. And look at the, what we've got left. We've got two more terms, and it's F32 and F23. So, uh, Newton's third law says that F32 is minus F23. So, that means that uh, this mess cancels out that mess. So, uh, that entire thing added up to zero. Now, okay, that was nice. I did it for capital N equals 3. But of course this works for n equals 53, or 103, or 1003, because every time f uh, i j appears in the sum, somewhere else f j i appears in the sum. And f i j and f j i are equal and opposite. So there's always a pairwise cancellation in the sum. And so what we've learned is that dp dt, the derivative of the total momentum of the system with respect to time, is equal to zero. So to sum up what I've done here so far, I have defined the total momentum, I have defined the individual momentum, and I've shown you that the time derivative of the total momentum of the system, if there's no external forces acting on the system, the total derivative the, the derivative of the total momentum with respect to time is zero. That's a very useful and powerful thing that you'll use uh, a lot, just like you use that, that en the total energy of a system is unchanging if, no ener if nothing is outside the system acting on it, and if nothing is leaking away out through the sort of boundaries of the system, the total energy of the system is unchanged. Here we have the same kind of fact except for momentum. That's flipped mini lecture 29.